Well, this is Mitch Peltonen, and uh, I forgot to punch the button right on the first time through, so he's going to share his testimony again for those of you who are watching by video. So, Mitch is coming in view of a call for Grace Point Fellowship Baptist Church as associate pastor and as minister to youth. So, uh, I give you Mitch Peltonen, and uh, he's going to share his uh, testimony and how I got to here. All right, cool. So, uh, my name is Mitch, like he said, and so when I was, uh, I was growing up, um, I had, uh, you know, I feel like, I don't know if you can hear me or not, but <clears throat> the, uh, I grew up in a, in a broken home. My mom was married three times and my dad was married twice. Um, so I moved around a lot as a kid. This is you're actually getting a little bit uh, different details than the first time through, and hopefully this will be uh, beautiful. But anyways, um, so I grew up bouncing back and forth between my parents' house every other weekend. So I go to church every other weekend when I was with my dad and stepmom. Now, during that time, I was not the best of kids. Uh, in fact, uh, my parents let me watch church from the bell tower, and we would play poker in the bell tower <laughs> and sometimes we would skip out of church I would run home I'd steal money from my dad's dresser and then run to 7-eleven and buy candy and we would do all that before the end of the service so needless to say I was a Christian by name only as I went through life um, and grew up I, I became decent in sports uh, I was a pretty good baseball player a decent football player um, and and I, I was very very confident in myself um, in fact, I was very, I was very arrogant. Um, I was very nice to everybody, but really, I think it was only because I wanted to make sure everybody was nice to me. I, I really cared about what people thought about me. And I'd walk down the hall, and I felt like I was king of the school. I felt like I was king of the world. Um, and then it came to a point where, in my life, I did. My parents asked me to deliver something to a neighbor's house one night. And so it was about 10.30 at night, and I was in Idaho, uh, Weezer, Idaho, to be exact. And I was halfway up on one of those mountain bluffs driving along in my mom's car. And so I hit the gas uh, to peel out a couple times. And it was a front-wheel drive, and I was a very inexperienced driver. I ended up losing control, and the car went off a 45-foot embankment and landed upside down. Uh, I broke my neck in three places. And there's a long story behind that that was pretty, pretty cool. I mean, in a sense where you see God working, but it was pretty incredible. Uh, that changed my life. And I had built my house on the sand. And I thought it was a fortress. And within that amount of time, it was completely gone. I went from feeling like I was one of the coolest people around to when I had this halo on my head and I'd be walking through a mall and everybody would stop and they would stare at me. I guess people didn't, hadn't seen halo as much at that time. And I felt like a freak. And, and so all of a sudden I went from being super cool to really having low self-esteem, like extreme low self-esteem. And so I ended up uh, trying to find that feeling I had before of invincibility and I couldn't find it anywhere and I tried it in numerous different ways basically every way that you can imagine that you shouldn't as a high school boy and then even off into college and and so much so that the happiness was never there I even started uh, even after school, I dropped out of Boise State University where I was going to school and started selling mobile homes, started making big, big bucks. I was managing my own store within a year. Um, and I was living a life with a brand new Jeep. I mean, everybody would think that Mitch has got the world by the tail. But I was absolutely miserable inside. I was lost. I, I was hurting. Um, in fact, I, I was, there was times where I was suicidal. And so... It came to a point where my best friend, Doug, called me on the phone and he asked me how I was doing. And I told him, Doug, you'd think I'd be happy. I have all this money. I have this brand new vehicle. I, I can party when I want. I can do this, I can do that. I, it, it, but I'm, I've, never, 
I've never been so miserable. And he asked me where Christ was in my life. And I did not get saved at that point, but I knew he was right. And so through some circumstances, the whole company went under. I, was, I lost my job in that company. I decided instead of going into that, keeping that business, I decided to go to Washington State and I just started delivering auto parts. And, and, and it's because of a sermon that I attended that told me that I needed to work for the Lord. And so it was a total answer to prayer because I knew that I was teaching people how to swindle people. I knew that I was teaching people how to, to take advantage of other people and them even thinking that they were getting a good deal. And I couldn't do that anymore. I couldn't look myself in the eye and know that I was doing that. And so I went from that point to Washington State and I went back to my old church and this church was weak, unfortunately. It was a very weak church. And, and, and they basically let you believe whatever you want to believe. So I wasn't hearing the gospel in this church, um, but I was, I was going to it. I was plugged into the youth group. I had kids coming over to my house. We were having prayer groups. We were having quote unquote Bible studies that were just absolutely fluff. And, uh, and I wasn't learning anything. And it wasn't until this drifter came along and he came in to the youth group and he was friends with the youth pastor. And he was actually sleeping on the guy's floor. I mean, literally this guy was a drifter. He would go from Bible camp to Bible camp to Bible camp and he would just help with those. That's how he'd get fed and then he'd go to the next place. He might be driving along the coast and sleep on the beach and he's talking about how he was sharing the gospel with a bunch of surfers who were smoking weed. I mean, he'd tell the craziest stories. And I was like, man, this guy's cool. And so we'd talk, his name was Spencer. Actually, his name was Robert Ulrich, but Spencer's what we called him because he got a ticket and they called him Spencer for hire back then. But anyways, so I, he invited me to a Bible study and at this Bible study, there was just everyday people. There was a postman or a mailman and his wife. There was an electrician and his wife. There was this drifter guy and every once in a while somebody else came in, but those people knew the Bible like nobody else. And I remember at that moment, as I was standing before this group, or I was standing, I was sitting in this group and they were going through Romans. And I remember thinking to myself, and he's talking about, you know, you, you are a sinner. And we, we are all sinners. And I remember thinking, yeah, everybody knows that. I mean, we're sinners. And they talked about Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. And you know what, to be honest, everybody knows that too. But it wasn't real to me until all of a sudden, I realized that when I was standing before God, every sin that I had committed, every single one of them wasn't just towards the people that I was sinning against, but I was sinning against a holy and righteous God. And because that holy and righteous eternal God was there, I deserved an eternal damnation. And so I fell in my heart and my mind and my down at the feet of the cross and I said, Lord, save me, forgive me. I can't believe that I, a wretch like me, am standing here and having Jesus come up next to me and saying, I take all of your sins, all of your guilt, all of the, are gonna be imputed to me. And they were placed on Jesus Christ. And I couldn't, I, in that moment, I understood that my sins from the past, my sins from the present, and my sins from the future were paid on that cross. And not only that, but all his good deeds. I had imputed my sin to him, but he had imputed his righteousness to me all his righteous deeds, all his good works. All of a sudden my account went from a negative number that couldn't even be seen to an overflowing account that was unbelievable. And so when God looked at me, the reason why I can be in heaven with him, the reason why I could actually be with Christ and Jesus, I'm sorry, Christ and the Lord, I'm kind of nervous because I'm talking to a camera, but <laughs> the reason I could be with him forever was not because when God looked down at me, he see my sins anymore. Because when he looked down at me, he saw his son, Jesus Christ. The righteousness that he saw in me was his sons. Everything that he saw in me that was good was because of him. 
And I was a new creature. I was born again. And the only thing I could think about talking about or doing was about Jesus. I wanted to know him more. And so within a few minutes, for the few months that I was, I was moving to Dubuque, Iowa, to, um, to, to Emmaus Bible College. And if you look it up, it's a great, great college. I strongly recommend it. But when I went there, it was difficult at first because I knew nothing about Christ. I knew nothing about him. And so... I was in the dean's office, and the dean was telling me, "Mitch, you're struggling. You, 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 I think my, I think my GPA at that point. Now it wasn't after the first semester. I think it was like midpoint. It was like a 1.6 or something. It was terrible. I mean, it was absolutely terrible. And he's like, "Mitch, if you keep this up, we're gonna have to kick you out. Do we have time? Is it better? We're gonna have to kick you out." And I was like, "Mr. Witter, no, Mr. Witter, you don't understand. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, I've learned more than anybody else in this school. You can't kick me out. I can't stop learning. I, I don't know what else I want to do. This is the only thing that I want to do." And he smiled. <laughs> And to this day, we've had the closest, well, not the closest relationship. I still talk to him today. Every once in a while, he says me happy birthday. He calls me Chuck because my first name is really Charles. He's a wonderful man, but he knew that I was growing. And by the end of the time that I was in my school, I was getting straight A's. And it, because Not because I was smarter. I'd never gotten straight A's in my life before. All I cared about was playing sports. So I just made sure my GPA was higher than the thing that they said I could play sports with. And so at this point, though, I just wanted to know. I wanted to learn. And so I, I took all my classes in youth ministry and biblical studies. That was my, that was my focus point. After that, I, I went to a camp. I lived at a camp. Uh, and that's where um, me and my wife got married. She came up, lived with us in Missouri. We, uh, at this camp, I was in charge of, 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 of children and teens and all this different, so I'm not in charge of it. There's a group of us in charge, the leadership. But I, I, I did every role. But there were so many kids getting saved. There were so many kids coming to know Christ. They had to create up a camp follow-up program at this church in town, and they asked me to do it. And so I was in charge of creating this thing that, that outreach to every kid that made a profession in Jefferson City, Missouri, and invited them to this camp. And we would and we would have these events that would help train them up and bring them in and we'd feed them and we'd play games and we'd teach the word of God. And that actually, I did not say this to the other group, but that program is still going today. Praise God. And so that was how we kind of got into ministry. I always knew that I wanted to be in full-time ministry, but my wife has an autoimmune disorder. So when we got married, she got very, very ill to the point where we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, many times throughout our life, we haven't known what's going to happen. Um, what her, her body attacks its organs individually from the inside. Sometimes it attacks her brain. Sometimes it attacks her stomach. Sometimes it attacks her lungs. Sometimes it attacks her skin. Uh, it's, 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 it's kind of crazy. Um, but through that, I was, I knew that I had to have a certain amount of insurance. And so my bivocational, uh, process to the point was explained because I have a company that gave me incredible insurance. And so I thought I was going to be a tent maker like Paul the rest of my life. And so as I was living this life, I didn't even contemplate that it might be something different than that. I didn't even contemplate. It. And so it was, but we'd be praying about it. We'd be praying, Lord, because I was working seven days a week, seven days a week for the last 16 years. Because when you work two jobs and you're working for a church, as you guys know, there is no part-time real work in church. You are sold out. You are into it. And, and, and it's not because it's a, it's a drudgery. It's because that's how you want it. To, you want it to be successful. You want it to, you want to see Christ work. You, it's not, it's not really work. It's a, it's a joy. And to see the fruit of it, you understand what Paul says when he, when he takes so much joy in, in the pursuit of people's lives in Christ. As you see them growing closer to Christ, that, that just made, Paul just explode with happiness. You can just read that all through Philippians as he's reading through that and you see his love for the people. And that's how I feel. That's how my wife feels. And as we see people grow, we'd be plugged in these ministries and that's all we did. So besides my job, we were just working with the church. And so how um, I, I taught the college class for, uh, it's, it's almost nine years, I think actually, uh, eight years solid, but almost nine. Uh, and we did many programs and stuff with them trying to, uh, to reach those kids. And that's a needy group. Um, and we had a decent 
a decent group of those kids throughout those times. But during that time, about halfway through, I started uh, the children's ministry, uh, running the children's ministry as a part-time gig. And I've done that for the last 14 years, um, 14 years in October. So it's almost 14 years. Um, and so uh, during that time, we've run major programs throughout outreaches to the community with trunk or treat, with, uh, you know, Bible drill trips that we go across the state. Um, different, there's just different events that I was in charge of. Vacation Bible school was my baby. Um, and so, you know, those are all things that, you know, that, that I was in charge of these last 14 years as far as the children go. But as far as youth, uh, we have been able to plug into those youth, uh, my wife and I. My wife is the youth minister secretary at our church. She also teaches youth choir. She teaches um, uh, uh, youth choir. She teaches a, a Bible study to the girls that she's been doing for over a couple of years. Um, and then we also teach adults. We teach adults every Thursday night. Uh, and so that has been a, it's a small group type setting. It's over Zoom. It was designed uh, for outreach for anybody. And so it is an evangelistic outreach, but it's also digging through the word of God and teaching it correctly verse by verse through uh, the different ones, even the tough ones. And that's been a super challenge for me, but we're seeing huge growth with adults. So we're seeing families catch fire for the Lord and you're seeing the parents developing into their kids and their youth like nobody's business. And some of these parents are, are struggling with heavy, heavy things. Some of their parents, like their, their granddaughter is, is dealing with her identity. She thinks she's a boy. Um, and that's something that I've been able to counsel with the parents and with the granddaughter. Um, not to the extent that I wish because she had to leave. Uh, but I've also been able to do canceling ministry with other adults um, and, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. We've been able to do hospital visits. Um, uh, not our head pastor, <laughs> he takes most of those, um, but I do get to do them from time to time. Um, it's not as frequent as I would like because part of the calling that I have and knowing how things have affected me is my wife being with that, uh, that immune disorder that she has. There's times when she's had to have a lot of different surgeries. In fact, what, we almost lost my wife when we had our daughter. Um, and so during those times, we've had pastors come along and sit with us for hours. And that is some of the most valuable learning that you can sit under when you're in the pain and they're, they're, they're ministering to you. And so one of the things you have with me is somebody who wants to be that for other people. I want to reach other people for Christ and I want to be there and minister to them when they're hurting. I want to be there when they're suffering from the loss of a family member. Um, you know, as far as, uh, other, I think we've talked about other stuff and the other, I don't know if I'm overlapping from some of the other uh, lessons, but really we've been called into the pastoral role because we want to see the church thrive in all areas. We want to see outreach uh, like nobody's business in ways that people don't think about. I want to see support groups for, for, for parents that, that of adopted kids. I want to see people with special needs um, being ministered to. Um, I, I want to, I see the upwards possibility that we have here that is so community oriented. And I can just picture us sharing the gospel with families that just don't know him. And if it's brought, the Lord's word doesn't come back void. And all I can say is here I am, Lord, send me. I know that I'm not worthy to share the gospel, but he does choose me to do it. And so I guess, I don't know exactly. I know that there's, I just got Gary here. So I'm talking to an empty room and I'm talking to you, but I hope that this is translating so you understand where my heart is as far as being an associate pastor, as far as being a youth pastor. Uh, I, 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 there's nothing else that I want to do. And I know it's not about what I want, but it, as I told the other group before, it's not an ambition, it's a compulsion. And it, it's from inside me and I can't stop it. So if the Lord doesn't call me here, then I know that he has somebody really great for you 
and it'll be great. But if he does call me here, I know that in his strength, I don't have any idea what's going to be accomplished, but I think it's going to be awesome. So that's all I really have to say. Part two. <laughs> okay. Is it video? Hmm? It's video. Yeah, I see a timer going, so. <laughs> Yes, if you have if you have questions, now's the time to, okay. to go ahead and ask those. I would I would okay, so until last night I didn't even know who we were working with, really. You know, and, and yes. Um I would like to see not only mission stuff being done outside of Magnolia, but even inside Magnolia. Um, what will those things be? Because I don't really know this area other than like certain landmarks right now. Um, that would be something that, yes, I would be, we are going to do that. Uh, um, especially during the summertime. I think that'd be a great time to try to do it like weekly, have different things that we do weekly. Um, one of the emphasis as well that I would like to do on Wednesday nights is not only just mission work itself, but teaching about missionaries, martyrs, and, and people of the faith that have made huge impacts for Christ. Um, and so that would be, well, I, I want to actually discuss this with the leadership group, though. I, I want to, I don't want to, I'm not going to wreck anything that's going great. And so that can be incorporated somewhere else if need be, but there's certain programs that I see, and I'd be willing to talk about those too, uh, that I think are, are incredible. And uh, and so we'll learn about people who are living for the Lord, and then we will go act it out. And so, um, so yeah, yeah, we do plan on it. So at least I, I pray we do. So, yeah. Is, I know sometimes it's a kind of a hard transition for our little people when I just medium sized people <laughs> to go from the children's into the youth. Yeah. Do you have anything specific that you've done or that you've seen that you like to do that, that makes that kind of transition? Yes. Um, since I was a children's minister, uh, your guys' 456 is much like our, we did stuff for fifth and seventh, we called it almost youth. And so in almost youth, we were trying to transition them to be ready for high school. One of the other things that I envision that I would really like to do is discipleship from different age groups. And so what we'd have is that the, the high school, and I, I haven't got it down to the quite numbers, we've got to see who we have and then really who is in a position where they can disciple, maybe not just help, but actually kind of bring kids along. But my hope would be a high school age would be helping with the 456. The junior high would be helping with the first through third. You know what I mean? And, and, and then actually as you go up, you'd have the, the, the college age helping with the junior high if we had those people coming back or they're locally. And then we'd have, you know, young adults would be pulling it and you just kind of go up all the way up to the grandparents. I really, it is critical in my ministry to utilize all levels of experience, knowledge, understanding. These kids have lost the appreciation of experience. And being a kid that came from, even though I was going to church, my dad was not a believer. There were Christian men that I still remember to this day who, who poured into my life. It's probably the reason why I knew that Christ was the answer even throughout those things. Why I called myself a Christian was from a guy named Bill Kyprios. Many, many people wouldn't teach the Sunday school class that I was in because I was a I was a tough kid to teach. But Bill Kyprios and, and another Bill too, which is name I can't remember his last name, those two men plugged into me. And uh, and so that's what I am hoping to establish. How what kind of level will that be? I don't know because I know that everybody's plugged into ministries. They should be serving somewhere, and I'm not here to stop any of those things. But I want to. I, one thing that I've been very good over the years is not killing people. And so, <laughs> praise God, not a single one, not a single one has died under my watch. But no. <laughs> I should use that as my skill set. That's right. <laughs> 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 
Next question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Um, <laughs> but with that being said, um, I really want people to be fed. And so if there's people that are helping all the time in a service type role and it's preventing them from getting fed themselves, there's certain things that I hope to be able to implement that feeds them as well. And that's what I was talking about with the leadership in the youth and also parents and just whoever it may be. Um, I really do want to, I don't want it to, some people just feel called to a certain age group. And so I don't want to like kick them out all the time. Um, but I also know that there's people that say, Hey, I can give you a three month commitment. Let's do it. So I would like, there, there's a lot of ideas that I have in order. I would love to teach a, a Bible study just for the youth leaders each week, just so they're getting fed as well. Now those ones that are teaching, especially when you're dealing with youth, they're going to be, they're going to be taking stuff in as they're preparing for the lesson. So I'm not saying they don't, and then they're going to have the Sunday sermon still. You're going to have your small group. There's their stuff, but I'll be completely honest. I am, I'm a Jesus freak. And so I can't get enough of this. And so I want to offer as many opportunities. So when people have free time that they can be learning too, um, or, or being helped. Like one of the things that I noticed last night is there's a group of kids that seem like they're hurting and, and, and my heart goes out to them. And I want to establish a program where we have a few adults. We can't just have one or two and that we need to have multiple because these kids are hurting that we offer a weekly and we don't even necessarily announce it. They just know under the table, Hey, six o'clock on Friday, we can show up to the church and there's people that will talk to us because I needed that. And so I know there's kids out there that do. And I want them to know Christ so they're not carrying the baggage that I'm carrying in my life right now. I'm forgiven for 100% of that baggage. But until I am until I'm glorified with Christ, God's government lives on and I'm carrying that. And yes, it's lighter now, but it still pops into my head and I wish it didn't. So anyways, I don't want those kids to have the same baggage. But those that do, I want to help them. So, all right, I think that, I don't even remember what the question yeah. was. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm sorry. What was your name, by the way? Casey. Casey. Cool. All right, who's next? Yes. Do you have any experience with special needs children? The, the, the special needs children that I do have is, I've dealt with a lot of autistic kids. I don't have any training in it, but I'm pretty good with them. You know, it, it takes a, it takes a while to figure out, you know, what makes them click. And then when you do, it's like awesome, you know? Um, so I have a, I definitely have a heart for it and I have a heart for the parents of it. Uh, but I, so yes. Um, in fact, there is, we just had a, a new family join the church and in my children's ministry, whenever I teach the children's church, there's a special needs kid that I specifically, he's a youth and he comes and helps me with mm -hmm. children's ministry. So yeah, if that, shows a little bit of my heart towards it. You know, I de it's actually, there's been throughout the years, there's been multiple of them. And so, uh, yeah, I, I have a big heart for it. Um, I think there's always a lot more I could learn. Um, and, and especially since each kid is different. Uh, but yeah, there's a, do you guys have one? Yeah, you'll get him next year. He'll, nice. He's, he's going into sixth grade. Oh, sweet, sweet. Yeah. Very, very cool. Yeah. Um, and then this year, hopefully, I'll get a chance to get to know him even before he comes up. That'd be one of the things that I hope to do. Um, you'll get to meet him tomorrow. Nice. <laughs> What's his name? Cooper. Sweet. Yeah. Be um, ready to be hugged. You're right on. Hard. Uh, hard. Oh, that's Hard. great. Uh, you don't have to tell him. No. You see. <laughs> Soft. <laughs> Soft. No, I, I welcome it. Yeah. He just weighed in 103 pounds. <laughs> wow. Oh my goodness. So, yeah, he's five foot four, 103 pounds, and it's solid muscle. <laughs> oh. Yes, he is. <laughs> no, but I, I do. Um, yeah, we. I've, I've had experience, you know, it's, it's, it's with kids that are more your Sundays right now. But, you know, right. but, but I have, 
but those kids go up to youth and I have relationships with them. So, you know, it's right. You know, so it's all and that's what, you know, we're, we're looking for because he's never been able to do because he, he does have a, he does have a seizure disorder, uh -huh. but it's for the attention span. He, he hasn't had one in gotcha. six years, six years, gotcha. you know, and if it is, it's not like a full grand mall. It's a facial but tip, point but, but the point is that we've been very reluctant to let him go to camps or yeah. anything like that because you know Absolutely. he's he needs, as, extra attention. he needs extra attention of course when we said you know can we sign cooper up they're like are you coming too right, right. and we're like no <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah you know yeah, yeah that's you know that's something we i know that as a whole i can't we're going to want the best for him you know what i mean so so to trying to figure out a way to make something happen like that that's where we're going to sit down and we're going to do whatever we can to figure it out you know that's a one thing I know that I don't have all the answers, but there's probably there's got to be an answer, and right? You know, so 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 we'll just have to we're happy just to have someone who's willing to try. Yeah, because we have been at places where we have to schedule when he comes yeah. because they have to have it's extra intimidating. people, right? You know, we can't just show up on a Wednesday night for 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 church, yeah, and say Cooper's here, and they're like, we don't have the we've been manpower. Away. Yeah, we've actually right. been turned away by the churches. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. And also, what one thing we'll have to do too, for sure, is just sit down and figure out all the different angles that we can, you know. Yeah, he, he doesn't understand a lot of things. And once you, uh, once you get, once people get to know him, then they're like, oh, wait, where's Cooper? Right. You know, yeah. they want to be around him. No, but we go to the grocery got... store. We're not Jimmy and Jennifer. We're Cooper's parents. Nice. So it's, you know. <laughs> oh, you're Cooper's dad. That's awesome. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, I look forward. I look forward, Lord willing, to uh, to get that all figured out because oh, yeah. I know that we'll be lifelong friends. And we, uh, yeah. he's getting to that age now that kids are not as nice as they used to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, yeah. and I, we don't, our struggle has always been, we don't want Cooper to be a distraction to some other kids' experience. Mm. So it has been a, t we were, have had some lucky moments where, We've had people say we want Cooper to come because it becomes a teaching moment yeah. for others. Well, I do know, yeah, and I do know too that in the churches I've been involved with, and the and the and the, and the kids that have special needs, you, you you'll find that youth groups will will bring them in as family, you know, and uh, and that's what I know. I can We've see already that. Noticed here. I can already Some see that. The kids like, here already. Yeah. Girls have really. And so I, I, I pray. Yeah. In fact, Gregory, who's graduated now, he's, he's, he just came back and helped me with my last event at the church, which was a drive-in movie. So, so they'll be plugged in even after their after school. Because, oh yeah, yeah, because it's going to be, you know, it's going to be good. Gonna, yeah, he's he's always had a, a, a set thing yeah. that he does. You know, he has a schedule. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we're trying to expand that, you know, Absolutely. and 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 get him out of that rut so to speak yeah and um you know doing youth events and stuff like that you know and we also want him to get used to that he doesn't have to do everything with mommy and daddy right you know it's okay to go do something with your friends yeah and not have one of us there well to add on to some so also one of my hard things is, is helping parents like you but also whenever somebody adopts kids they say that 99% of all adopted kids have reactive attachment disorder to some level. And that's something that I've, I, I wouldn't say that I've taken classes on it, but I want to. It's something that I have learned on and dug into, but it takes a church to help a family raise kids that are adopted, that have special needs. That we are a family, as you guys say. We don't, what is it? What's the, what's the motto? Is that we don't, we're not like family. We're not, we are family, right. And, and part of that is coming alongside each other and helping us raise our family because those kids that have reactive attachment disorder, they will act like angels at church. But when they come home, it's a nightmare. And so you see these parents absolutely frazzled and they're dying inside and they come out there and then the, the and, and they're like trying to express this and all of a sudden this kid's acting like a total angel inside the church and they're like these are just bad parents 
And I tell you, you look up reactive attachment disorder, it's crazy, but I guarantee that if we start doing some type of an outreach to adoptive parents, it's gonna bring in people to this church because they need help. And we're the family that can help them. And so as we have those things that are outreach, I know that those ministries that we can minister to these people's needs, we will win them to Christ. We will win them to Christ because that is the love that we're going to be showing them is Christ's love. So that's one of my heart things. You talk about some of the outreach things that I envision. That's one of them. I hope to do. I know that I'm inadequate at this point, but my heart wants to help them. My heart wants to help people that are uh, that need help. So what else? Sorry. One more question before we take a break. Yes. Do you have any examples of um, maybe conflict amongst youth or maybe even youth parents and how you handled that? Oh, let me think. It's been pretty smooth. Yeah, let's see. You know, as far as uh, conflict, Andy, if you think so, just pop it out of me. Um, and we've had parents that that didn't like each other. <laughs> um, as far as I as, usually get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Son of the pastor. As far as kid conflict, uh, growing up like I did and, and understanding I did, generally speaking, I've had great success talking to kids one-on-one -on -one as far as conflict goes between kids and and the Lord has blessed it it seems for me to be able to really cut through to the chase um, one of the things that uh, that I really try to strive with these kids too and really with parents as well is a Matthew type conflict resolution where you know the first thing when you're having a problem is you go to the person in person and and if that, you know, when you see somebody in sin, you go to them and if, if they don't change, you bring a couple of witnesses. That doesn't mean a witness isn't somebody that you told about and how they know what's going on, so they go too, but it's people that have actually observed it, they're witnesses. And so you go along with their, and this is actually commended by Christ. This is a Christ step process instituted for the church. And so therefore, then it goes before the church. So, uh, with that being said, the first two principles, it, the going to the church level is almost never there. But when there is problems, we come alongside them in that group effort and, and try to come to a biblical uh, resolution. But I haven't had too many problems. I'm just not thinking of anything, Brian. Uh, <sighs> Sounds like you maybe you nipped him in the bud before it got there. Well, I appreciate he's just trying, he's trying to help me out. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I would like to think that's true. Uh, I run a pretty tight ship. Um, I, I know I kicked Tabitha out of Children's Church in uh, third grade. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and she's been an angel since, has she not? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, uh, but I have learned, I mean, I've learned over the years that I've overreacted in some areas. Um, there was there was a kid who I didn't recognize who had he had some issues that I didn't quite recognize, and he would act up a lot in class. And 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 this was early on in my in my um, in my children's ministry work, and he was a sixth grader, so he was older, and. Uh, and so I was too harsh with him in the hall. And then I brought him to his mom, explained what happened, realized that I was at fault. I, I learned a, a lot from that. I think dealing with, dealing with issues, especially when it comes to outbursts or, or anger or verbal fights or whatever it may be, um, you know, praying that I will have the fruit of the Spirit in, in dealing with them um, has been probably one of the most 
uh, helpful things and and uh, you know what I'm sure I'll think of something as soon as we get done with this and then I'll tell you what I'll call you Brian but uh, <laughs> um, but I really don't have a, 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 a great answer for that other than I, I take things head-on um, I know that at camp we'd have a lot of, of interesting things so I guess in camp I could, uh, we had a kid that was taking pictures of himself and then and they were like sticky pictures and he put them all over a counselor's bed and uh, now thankfully we found it before the counselor even went into the room and so there were some issues there where this was a needy kid off the streets of Oklahoma and this is in Missouri so it's a long drive home and so we went through special steps to try to well to reach the kid for Christ number one but two putting him in an environment that he wasn't able to do something in a devious nature like that uh, and then try to take him under our wing and really pour into him um, that was that was that was that was one of the more scary situations for me I'm, I'm glad that we it got found before it was you know weird um, but I don't think the guy would put him all over his bed anyway so I think he'd have a pretty good defense yeah. but even so it's not something that you want right even in the in the cabin and so um, you know that's that's one situation that pops into my head and that kid ended up having to go home they had to drive somebody from Oklahoma the second to last day of camp and pick him up and take him home um, and so sometimes that happens but uh you know, I, I'm one not to, okay, so in all situations, I guess I'll just give you my rule of thumb, and maybe this is why I haven't had any problems. But the first thing I need to do, and I've already told somebody in this room this already, but the first thing you need to do in any situation when it's, when it's unknown is you've got to do what's right. So the first thing is to do what's right, and then you push it towards what's excellent. So in that situation, you have to decide, okay, before the Lord, what is the right decision to make? And that is never the easy answer. So as you go through that, this is what I have to do. And then when you've done that, you push it to make it even better. You try to make it excellent. Sometimes you can't, but you never go below what's right. And so in that situation with conflict, in whatever situation that would be, my first hope is what I would be striving to do what was right. So, good answer. Yeah. All right. We're back with Mitch, our, our third session, and our first question is going to come from Ms. Connie. Okay, um, I asked you this question when we interviewed you, but I'd kind of like you to share it with the group. Um, you come from a children's ministry, and I know you come from a, a small group of kids that are, they come from a small group of schools. You said there's only like one or two different schools that they come in from, right? Uh, well, we have, we have three high schools. Oh, three high schools, okay. Yeah, yeah we have three high schools. Okay, so... One unique thing about our youth group is we have a very diverse group of kids. We have homeschool, co-op, we have... Oh, we have the majority of them come from one high school. Right. That's, that's, yes, the majority yeah, of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have, a, I mean, and, and we don't even have a majority here. We have co-op, homeschool, yeah. we have um, Christian school, multiple high schools, multiple junior highs that all feed yeah. into our youth. So they're here together on Wednesdays and on on Sundays and then they go and there might be one of them at their high school and one of them at their junior high and one of them at their co-op. So how do you plan to take that group from all different types of schooling and different areas and create a core solid foundational youth group where they they are like family? Absolutely. Well, it's a passion of mine. So, so, so honestly, um, <laughs> there's only two types of people in the world. Those who know Christ and those who don't. And those who don't aren't the enemy. They're the mission field. So as we are incorporating our family in Christ, as we are incorporating how we live as Christians, as we're instilling that in the youth, part of that is the the camaraderie of, of fighting this fight together. You know, of, of us coming together the common goal of, of, of to reach and to teach you know that's, that's the I was telling Gary I, I doubt that I came up with that but I say it all the time and I pretend like it's mine I've never heard anybody else say it but I'm sure there has been 
but you know we are to go out there and reach the lost and we are to make disciples and as a group as a conglomerate with our youth group if we are divided then there's a problem because there is no division in christ and so as we grow closer to christ we are inevitably going to be growing closer together and so as a I'm not saying that we won't ever have some type of fun little rivalry thing, but that definitely won't. It's something that we actually have kind of a problem with in our youth group because there's so many kids that go to the same high school and there's only a few that don't. So those two are kind of automatically on the outside. And so it's hard for the big group to see it, but I'm also not a part of that. And as we brought up that problem, because our daughter was one of them, it kind of got swept under the rug. And I'm not throwing them a thing. They have a lot of fish to fry, you know. And and, and our kid's pretty strong, so she's not going to say much, you know. So it's not like it's a really outward glaring problem. Um, but it is a problem. So I understand that problem. And, and, and but I do believe with what our mission as a whole with the youth, as far as them understanding who Christ is, understanding who their brothers and sisters in Christ are. And as we, as we travel this together and learn to travel this together, I don't think there's going to be barriers that last for long. You know, I, I know that there'll be times when they're playing football against each other. There's going to be some banter. Right, you know, right, you know, right. You know, uh, <laughs> there's going to be, and I'm not here to just, you know, take away all the, right. you know, the normalcies of, of, of childhood. But there's a need because wherever you have kids, there's going to be clicks. It, it happens. Yeah. But to love your neighbor as yourself, and then even Philippians, where you love your neighbor, you, you love your neighbor more than yourself. That is what I'm trying to learn myself, and then hopefully that'll impart to the kids too. Because if I don't believe it, if I'm not living it, then I can't expect them to come to the level either. And so. But, but I, I, in God's strength, I, I do feel that way. I mean, that's why, that's what, <clears throat> there's two different types of pastors. There's pastors that are led by ambition, which is means they are in it for themselves. They want to be on that pedestal. They want to be lifted up. They want to be glorified. Whether they know that or not, that's just how they are. And then there's pastors that are led by compulsion. They can't do anything else. God has given them a purpose and has to glorify Him. And as you have, you get, I see that here. And I want to be a part of that here because I share that and the ones that are out there for ambition that you see out there they make me sick <clears throat> and I'm not here to tear them down I know that Paul even says that they have the wrong motives but if they're sharing the gospel people are getting saved and so praise God but I also know that 26 of the 27 New Testament books talks about false teachers talks about the apostate coming into the church it's not saying you have to be warned it's saying it's here and so part of our desire to grow in Christ <clears throat> is to be able to look at a wolf that's dressed like a sheep and see it's a wolf and the problem that we have with the youth today and I'm not saying here at all I'm just saying in general but I taught college for eight years they don't know the gospel you ask them why they're saved and they say I asked Jesus into my heart and you say what does that mean and they don't know I'm not here to 
give them a prayer to repeat after me so they can have a get out of jail free card in their pocket. I <coughs> want them to truly know Christ because every time I got a chance at camp to raise my hand, which I went to church every other Sunday. I came from a home and they talked about, I was afraid of hell. I was not afraid of God, but I was afraid of hell. So every time they gave me the opportunity to get out of jail free, I took it. And I repeated prayers after people, one after another, after another. And I was never changed. But the moment that I was born again, my whole life changed Amen. immediately Amen. and permanently. All of a sudden, I went from somebody who said terrible words, and I'm not even going to give you the first letter of them, because <laughs> I don't just think it. In front of my mom, in normal conversation, to somebody who was extremely convicted by glorifying God with my speech, in an instant. Now, I'm not saying I never screwed up, but I'm saying is I was changed. I used to say God's name just normally, casually, in, in all my conversations as a superlative. And then all of a sudden I was in a dorm room. I remember I got saved and I almost immediately went to a Mace Bible College. And I remember saying that and all of a sudden nobody even said anything. I just realized I'm saying the Lord's name in vain. What am I doing? Conviction. When you're born again, the Holy Spirit starts working. You start with justification, right? And then you have sanctification. Then you have glorification. So after the justification, I'm working in the sanctification process. But it's amazing when you're born again. He who began a good work in you will complete it under the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. So we see these people out here that aren't living for Christ, but they call themselves Christian. We, we are called. Another verse that people misquote is, do not judge lest you be judged. What I'm here to tell us is we are not to judge by passing condemnation on people. Our goal in those things, if you look before that, it says do not cast your pearls before swine. Do not, you know, the dog return, whatever. There's, there's, there's just one after another after another. It says you have to use judgment in your walk. You have to use judgment in what you do. But we are not to condemn. We're to restore. Our desire is to bring people to Christ. God's the one that shuts the hammer down. And that's not our job. Now, we protect the sheep. We do what's right. We follow the disciplinary steps. When you kick somebody out of a church, it isn't because you don't like them. It's not because of the enemy. It's for the desire that they will be restored and be able to be brought back into the church as a believer in Amen. Christ who's that's born right. again. Yep. You know? And so what we have... <clears throat> is a philosophy that the youth need to understand before they leave. They need this foundation. We have the chief cornerstone in place and it has to be built up. This foundation has to be built up. And if you don't have the parents on board and you don't have people, the, 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 the volunteer, everybody on board together as a group, it takes a church. <clears throat> then we are no better than the other church down the street that's sending these kids off. And I've seen the damage it does. I taught these college kids forever, and it's heartbreaking. And all of a sudden they go in, how many of their professors don't believe in Christ? In fact, so much so, their presuppositions is there is no God. And so as they are teaching these kids this stuff, everything that they're teaching is saying God isn't in the picture. And they make fun of and they laugh and they and they say how stupid you are for believing in Christ. Oh, you feeble-minded person. And then that pressure comes. And if they have no foundation, they're going to crumble. And they're going to say, this is just my mom and dad's religion. I, I'm smarter now. I'm listening to smarter people. They don't understand that this is the truth there is no other source of truth in this world. Amen. Yep. And so if you want to build your foundation on Christ, you've got to go to His Word. You want to hear God speak? Open your Bible. Read it. As one of the most wonderful people I listen to says, if you want to hear God speak out loud, read your Bible out loud. 
And we will teach your kids to understand how to read this in context. And hopefully even some of you don't necessarily know. Because I guarantee we could say some verses out right now that I took out of context four years and I went to Bible college. But I wasn't reading in context. And that's why I'm glad you brought that one up to me. But thankfully I knew, so I didn't look dumb. <laughs> but, but honestly, guys, this is, this is real. The spiritual warfare. We, you guys are given every day that you wake up, you are given a day to serve God. He gives you every breath. I have crazy stories. To, anyways, glorify God every day that he gives you. Put on the armor of God and run the race. There is no days off in Christianity. Whoever you've been put around, you've been put there for a reason. I want the kids to understand that. When they go off to school, they're actually missionaries. They're believers. They are missionaries in their school. And not only the bad, there's not just rainbows and butterflies that come with being a Christian. As we know that those who love Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Let me quote that correctly. And so we have to ask ourselves, when was the last time you were persecuted? When was the last time you lived godly in Christ Jesus long enough to be persecuted? And that convicts me. I don't say that at you to condemn you. I say that because I'm trying to live my life in a way that's worthy for God to grant me that blessing. And to teach others that that is a blessing, God. To be able to to associate yourself with Christ. Associate with his persecution. That you would be given the honor to suffer for Christ. That might not be the most exciting thing to talk about. But that is what your kids are going to learn if you pick me. When we're going to go through the word of God, we're going to talk about the hard stuff, the easy stuff, the fun stuff, the ugly stuff, everything. It's not going to be just pick and choose. This is an easy lesson. This is an easy lesson. Some of the stuff I might even have to mass email out and say, okay, hey, this is a subject that if they put in the question box and they're talking about something that not all parents, I fully support parents saying, this is something that I want to talk to my kid about. And if we get enough of that, okay, we can't do this on a Wednesday, we're going to have to have a special night for it. We're going to have to bring certain people in and then we're going to divide up the girls and the boys and we're going to talk about it in that type of a setting. Yes? Just to piggyback on what you just said, I know that all all of us are facing this, probably our youth more than anything, the gender roles within our church and within our society. So how are, like I have all boys, Mm -hmm. um, uh, but so how are maybe your stance or the way that kind of your vision for specifically gender roles within the church and in our world and just that, I mean, we all know everything that's going on. Now we're talking. <laughs> this is something that I have actually I know I've dealt with firsthand. Not to the extent that I've been able to or even necessarily want to. But one of our good friends, son, is now calls himself Cindy. I wasn't able to, he had moved off to do his career when that happened, the only people I was able to minister to were the parents. And we did. I mean, we go out and we sit, we talk, we pray. And you go to the word of God and you come alongside him like a church. As far as the kids go, there's a, a, a girl that I got to talk to that with the the family's blessing. Um, I was trying to talk to her, but we were waiting for that person to talk, to open, to say it. And so the little bits I was able to talk to her before she went away, um, they were unfortunately, to this point, unsuccessful. But that person heard the gospel. And that's the first and foremost thing is Jesus Christ. When somebody's born again, those things tend to start ironing themselves out. I'm not saying they're not going to have serious baggage from that. They will. In fact, when you look at sexual immorality in Romans, Romans 1, that stuff affects you immediately and permanently. 
That's a baggage that they're, they're gonna carry for the rest of their lives, but we're here to help them carry their baggage and, and help them to understand that they're new creatures in Christ. But what I would hope to do, and I know that we have that situation here, I've heard, in, in one situation I've heard anyway, and, and I think I'm right. Um, it's something that I have tried to study. I try to gather as much information as I can, but when it really boils down to it, when you're talking to that person, you don't even have to, that sin has nothing to do with all the other sins. When you go through the 10 commandments, I mean, how many lies have we told in our life? We got some people in here that probably told a lot. (laughs) How many, if we look at uh, every one of us, if we're being honest, has stolen something in our life. Multiple things, probably. Whether that be downloading music illegally, whether that be time clock fraud, whether whatever it may be, we're all thieves. We're all liars. You know, none of us have murdered anybody, but we know that Jesus said <laughs> clearly, if you call your brother a fool, you're guilty of committing murder in your heart. We're all murderers. We're all adulterers because Jesus said that if you look at a woman with lust, and really anybody the opposite, you look at somebody with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. You go through all the Ten Commandments, those aren't screamed out to damn us. They're called to scream out that you need a savior. That is a call. And the beautiful thing about the law, the beautiful thing about the law, is that those are God's attributes. They are an image of who he is in his purity and his righteousness. And I would, one of the things that I've been trying to ask people when they say, oh, I don't want to be all those rules and stuff like that. I was like, which one of the Ten Commandments is bad? Which one would you get rid of? Which one do you not want to follow? (laughs) And and that's a a question that kind of throws people. It's a really good way to to open up uh, the gospel to them. But those are the things that I'm still learning. I'm still learning different ways to share Christ with people. I do have a passion for it. I'm deathly afraid of, of doing it just like everybody else. But every once in a while, God gives me the, the strength to do it. Um, we're, we're very big with our boys and being um, spiritually mature. Um, and so we have that type of a thing. Uh-huh. And I think in a lot of our churches, even though everybody in here will tell you, I'm certainly not a wallflower. That's not what I'm saying. But um, in, you know, just teaching our boys the the beauty of, of my role and my husband's role. And I know a lot of churches are kind of shying away from that. And so, so I was just kind of... So, like, to be clear, are you asking what my views are on Just the kind of your of, thoughts on how you are... I like her. Pouring, <laughs> your thoughts and how you're pouring into your youth about that each... Each role is beautiful and specific without taking over the other. Right. Okay, well, let me let me tell a, a brief story. There was a there was a, a lesbian that worked for me when I was in Jeff City, Missouri. During my break I was reading my Bible in the break room. She came back and she asked what I was reading. And, uh, and and I can't. I don't think I was reading Ephesians, but I'm sure you speak up. Oh, I don't know if I was reading Ephesians or not. But she goes. So, <laughs> no, it's good. <laughs> I do go with background music. <laughs> uh, no, that would be. No, never mind. Sorry. Um, she asked me. She goes. My mom told me that Paul is a woman hater. And um, I was like, really? And so we opened up the Ephesians and I was like, do you realize that, that Paul told men to love Christ like Christ loved the church and gave himself up? I was like, that's the most sacrificial love that you can even imagine. <clears throat> but on each side of that sandwich is, is women called to submit to their husbands. And so you have a reciprocal thing. I mean, there was no greater servant leader than Jesus Christ. And you saw that in even him washing the feet of his disciples. I mean, that is beautiful. That 
the God of all creation came down and washed the feet of man? You know, you read through that part in Philippians talking about his humility. And it's almost so, it, it is so deep. It's like peeling back the layers of an onion as you go through that. You can, we can't fully comprehend the humility of Christ. But man, it is glorious as you start understanding that more and more. But that is how we are called to love our wives. And so, as you are putting those two things together, yes, we are called to lead and be the spiritual leaders of the household. But how we do that, you can see that as you read through the Gospels and how Jesus treated his disciples and how Jesus lived his life and how he, in his very acts and works. And what you see there is it's absolutely the perfect love. You know, and, and men are called to love their wives. Wives aren't called to love their husbands. It's kind of funny. <laughs> but they are, you know, and the reason that is, and I learned this from somebody else, this isn't me. I think I'm just a regurgitator. Men want to be respected by their wives. When men are respected by their wives, they will run through a brick wall for them. And so what you see in that beauty, that's what men need. I don't need my wife to bring me home flowers. I don't need, I want my wife's respect. That's how men work. Women need to be loved. Men aren't that great at it. That's part of the work. And as we know, I, I grew up in Seattle, Washington, where submitting is a, is a, is the dirtiest word that you can say no matter who it's to. And so it was very difficult for me to comprehend that, to comprehend this stuff until I started realizing what Jesus did for us, until I started contemplating his submissiveness to the Father. And they are equal, absolutely equal. But there's no doubt the love between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's no doubt. And so teaching the kids that would be, well, it's going to be a joy. You know, it's going to be a joy. And it's going to be a work. I mean, some kids it's going to be harder than others. You know, it's just the way it is. But, but it'll be a joy. It'll be fun to talk on. And that'll probably be sessions that we break up with guys and girls, you know. And guys need to get it hammered to them. And, and whether they're younger and they're older, there'll be different levels. And we'll see how it goes. You know, it's kind of be one of those things where, you know, maybe that's a, you know, I heard like two years ago, they took them off to a camp and they had their own little camp where one floor was guys, one floor was girls. I, was, I don't think uh, Carrie's here, but the uh, that would be a great time to discuss things like that. You know, where you have that group off to themselves and it's out there. And, yeah. Anyway, that's just a thought. All right. Good question. Very good question. Yeah. Um, I'll listen to your uh, the, uh, Facebook live things that you put out um what age group was that to well it was first to sixth okay. um now depending on i knew which kids were on it live mm -hmm. and so some of those kids were kids that i've been teaching for a while so they understood sins of omission sins of commission they knew sin you know like they, they these kids were these kids are bright they're eating stuff up you know and so there's also some times when i would see somebody pop on that would be like even for my Bible college, I don't believe is saved, and so, um, so the gospel would get hammered even harder. You know, um, there. So it was, uh, but the first through six. Now I knew also from my church that most towards the end, most of the first, second, and third graders were already back attending church, so they weren't coming. That's why we had two hundred and some views in the beginning, and then we're down to like fifteen or whatever it was, something small at the end until it was none. Well, not none. We stopped before that, thankfully. Uh, but we also had kids that were watching on Zoom. And so it adjusted what I said. But generally speaking, I would go through and I would learn it for myself. That's kind of my process. And then I would say, okay, how do I impart this to the group that I know is going to be there? You know, and these are fifth and sixth grade kids. 
And so these fifth and sixth grade kids, I know what level they're at. What can I impart to them? And then whoever else comes on, what can I hit and, and give them lasting truths with? Sometimes it was super successful. Sometimes it wasn't. It was a little bit difficult just to talk to yourself, to be honest. So, so it was a, uh, it was a, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, because yeah. yeah. you don't have the eyes. Like right now, I'm. This is actually my element. Believe it or not, even though I'm still nervous about what question maybe could be asked, I really, well, I'm just being honest. So, so I don't really have to hide anything. I'm not worried about selling anything. Um, so I'm really comfortable right now in front of a group of people I don't know. But praise God. I think that's probably why I can do what I do. But when you're talking to nobody, or you can talk to just somebody who pops in, there was times when my professors would come in from a Mass Bible College. It would, it would, it was terrible. Like it was terrifying. I was like. <laughs> I wish I wrote better notes in my head. I was like, no. You know, I was like, I didn't prepare like last week. Why didn't they come on last week? You know, and, uh, you know, so, um, yeah, so I don't know which one you watch. There's a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, some of them are real snoozers. The two that, uh, two that you linked, I think, there was one on Cornelius and one on both Peter. Okay. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, the, the uh, yeah, those were just... We were just trying to get, reach the kids that weren't getting yeah. Sunday school. I'm yeah. just curious what age bracket you were talking about. Yeah. Just first through six. Yeah. I want to ask you a question about an area that we've not discussed a whole lot. You've given us some some answers that I think naturally flowed into an associate pastor's direction. We've talked to you about being you know available to do whatever we need. Yeah. We talked about uh, uh, you know assimilation. We talked about education. We talked about uh, outreach, and we've talked about outreach through uh, ac church activities, which we really need some, you know, some help with in, in organizing for for out all, you know, for the purpose of both outreach and inreach. Yeah. Uh, you've you've worked a lot with. Uh, it sounds like a lot of different ages. Uh, speak briefly to the nature of your ability to. Uh, to take an assignment uh, and let me just say you know that I would say look, you know, look, we're, we're, we're trying to, to put together some more home groups mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, you know you feel confident in, in taking that and uh, what would just briefly what would be your process of, of doing that or just about any other uh, ministry that we ask you to do from the adult perspective okay um so as far as, well, home groups, you start with the purpose, right? And, 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 and that, you're looking at the dartboard of a church, and the center has to be Christ, right? Everything else is just details. And the home group is a beautiful thing because the center of that is definitely Christ. And so... We, as we grow as a church, and I know that you guys have already established some home groups, and I've never been in a church that actually has had home groups before, but I am familiar with them. Those group of people grow together like a Sunday school class. They, they iron sharpens iron. Um, one of the things that I would love to do would be to help start some of those home groups myself, you know, as the person that would get those groups going We'd hopefully have somebody establish his leadership, help bring them along to teach and, and, and to grow. I know a lot of that home group, too, is also fellowship. It is, it is, it is also growing close to knowing each other and, and coming together. But as far as, as uh, making sure that that center is Jesus Christ, I would want to come along and, and, and try to help them as best I can. Uh, I think some of the, and I don't, I don't mean to, to veer it, off too much but I would we would definitely have to um, I mean how many home groups do we have in the church right now mm, probably four or five four or five okay I don't know how active they are still right now but. you know um, I think uh, obviously I think one of the things that we that most churches struggle with and I think a lot of it happens to not necessarily even be from the church's effort in it, but it's communication. And so trying to break through those areas to get people to 
now sit with them and understand the importance of coming together. We, we have established a small group that meets on Zoom uh, that we've been doing for a year and a half on Thursday nights. It's, it's a Bible study that we teach and we go through books one thing at a time. Uh, so I do have, and it's adults. And so I do have experience in leadership in running a small group for the last year and a half. Uh, we have taught through, I think by the time people started coming on, it was from Mark 8 on. We taught through Second Timothy. We talked through Philemon. We're going through Jude now. Um, any of you guys are welcome to join. It's on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Um, and it is outreach focused. What we do as a group when we talk to, especially the people around there, we are trying to reach people for Christ through that as well. In fact, with that, please be praying for a girl named Danny. She's actually a, uh, she's a lesbian that has a wife and a kid, but she wants to know about Christ. Hmm. And so she's come two out of the last three weeks. And in Jude, we happened to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah on that those two weeks. So I was petrified. <laughs> but I wanted to speak the truth in love. And so with those small groups, the reason why that person was coming is because we have certain people in that group that are continuously outreaching to people. They are doing whatever they can to get people in those things. And those are people that are just on fire for the Lord. So within our small groups, we need to be teaching people to outreach. We need to be teaching people to encourage. We need people, if they're not showing up, that they're reaching those other people. And, and, I've, and it's been a wonderful experience for us. And we're seeing people in that group grow like I have never seen people grow ever in my life. And that's a testament to him and the truth of the word. And so... I don't know if I'm answering your question because, like I said, I don't have a lot of experience with what you guys have with with uh, small groups. But I do know how to run one. And I do know how to encourage people in theirs. And I would be even willing to join them for how long it took to get it solidified. And maybe it's a small step. Maybe it's one thing. Briefly list then what your, your gifts and abilities and even leanings are that would help you in an associate pastor's role here. Well, I, I definitely, um, I definitely love to preach. Uh, not that I expect to do that in the capacity of, of here, but just even in front of the, in front of any adults that will listen. Like the, that, we want. I want to reach whoever will listen, and so whether that be teachers, whether that be students, whether that be um, uh, college, whether that be uh, parents, whether that be senior adults, um, but. Some of the aspects of pastoral heart that I have would be in the care of like hospital stuff. Um, Dandy being like she is uh, with some of the stuff that we've had to go through. We've had pastors come alongside us and sit with us in a hospital room for five, six hours. And that's some of the most impactful things that I've ever had. And I want to instill that too. In fact, I wouldn't, I would not for a second hesitate to jump out the door at any time to be at a hospital. Uh, my heart is for the people to be there with them for Christ, to be alongside them. Um, as far as uh, maintenance goes, I will do the best I can to help with whatever thing that pops up here or there. <laughs> These guys are much better at than me, but I know I'll learn a lot quickly. We're not too um, worried about maintenance, bro. <laughs> Except on <yeah>. people. <laughs> so, as far as outreach goes, though, I know that we have a gym here. We have the potential for upwards basketball. Um, we have the potential to reach those families for Christ. I see the potential to be able to share the gospel with people that are in the crowds every time that we have a game. I see the potential for us to reach people like I talked about with, with outreach when it comes to, 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 to families that need help through parents that are out there offering that to. I want to go to the place, I don't know where they have them around here, that, that, and see if we can give out flyers and, and things that say, hey, if you want a support group for, because you've adopted a child, here we are. 
and outreach in the communities in those areas. I, outreach as far as it goes, I am willing to listen to any idea that we have to share the gospel. And as petrified as I will, I will gladly deliver the gospel to whoever is before me in fear and trembling. And so as far as outreach goes, I'm willing to go to any avenue, to any way to do it, as long as Christ is at the center. And if Christ isn't at the center, then I'm not saying we scrap it. We just figure out how to get Christ in the center. Yeah. And so um, I'm very evangelistic minded. You know, that's really been my passion since I got saved. So thank you. Um, uh, what else? To follow up on, on your question, uh, because because I, I know the way Gary works. Um, <laughs> how, how independent can you be? In other words, if, if we say, okay, we need to set up, do X. How much um, guidance do you normally do? And have you have you do you have experience with people said we need to get this done? You said, got it, take off and go. And how much? So in my secular job. Okay. I was a district team leader for Hibbit Sports for 20 years. I trained people to run their stores all around the country. They would fly me to Orlando and I'd teach all the managers there how to run their stores. Um, I, I did that because I was, I was one of the better managers in our company. I know how to put projects together and I know how to get things done. Um, when you give me a task, there might be a lot of questions to try to figure out the variables, but once I have the variables, then it'll just be a matter of the only time you'll hear from me is when I need to make sure I get something dotted or crossed. Um, but that being said, I know I'm not a perfect person. You know, that, there might be some mistakes made, but I guess that's just life, right? Yeah. But that being said too, I will work within the freedom that is given. And so if it's called on me to get something done and one way or another, then it'll get done one way or another. But if it's called to get to the certain point, I can do that too. Um, I put myself in full submission to the pastor of our church. You know, so with that being said, I'm not saying that whatever he says, if I see something, I'm not going to say, well, you know, how does that work? Um, but there are certain aspects too that that are are going to be somewhat new to me. You know, because I've never been a pastor, you know, associate pastor, but that doesn't change how you uh, view people. Uh, me and my wife as a couple, as far as pastoral goes, I don't know of, especially with her, it's pretty crazy. Her phone rings off the hook and it's, and it's, and it's people in our church that, that need somebody to talk to. And, and I'm also one of those people that isn't very stoic. I don't hold my, I'm pretty, I'm out there. I'm very, I'm more emotional than I wish I was, you know? Uh, and so with that being said, when people are in need and they need to hear, I've been able to do many, many counseling sessions with, 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 with adults, um, as well as youth, as well as, in fact, the person that was struggling with that identity issue, that parent was, came to me to try to reach them but I also was ministering to her and her husband. And so as far as the counseling ministry goes, that's always been a, a real personal thing in my heart to be able to work with people and try to help them. So, um, you know, and they're actually some of the people that I use as my reference because I knew they knew my heart as a shepherd, you know, an under shepherd really, because Christ is the great shepherd. But as far, and I know I'm probably talking too quietly, <clears throat> but, There is nothing that I want to do more than to serve the people of Christ. And that comes from the very eldest one in our church to the little baby. You know, so if that's what you get with me, um, I'm quick to learn. Uh, I taught just back into the secular world a little bit more. I didn't, I talked to you about how I made money selling and swindling people in a sense. Um, you know, if you bump somebody two times after their initial offer, even if you don't need to bump them, they leave happy because they felt like they worked it. And so they would leave with a smile on their face. 
when I went into service ministry and, 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 and management, I was serving adults already because when they came in and you see a mom that's wearing a nurse's outfit and her kids come in, they start tearing up the store. What you need to do with the pastor's heart is put yourself in their shoes and realize, I don't know if this lady is a single mom who's been working 12 hour shifts at the hospital for four straight days and just wants to get home. And she doesn't have the energy to tell her kids to do anything right now. And so one of the things that I would see in that would be to serve her in the capacity that I had. And every once in a while, I even got to share Christ with customers. So the pastoral heart for people is always there. Um, but as far as getting stuff done, you know, I guess the fear that I have is I know that there's all these talented people in this church, but I don't know what any of them do. And so like, let's say you say, hey, I need you to, to, to we're gonna, we're gonna create a, a you know, we're going to do a barbecue and we're going to do this. We're going to do that. And I'd be like, you're in charge. And then they walk away. I'm like, I don't even know who cooks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but the thing is, <laughs> that's right. But I do know that I have people that I can get those answers from. So I think in the beginning, there'll be more questions. But as things go, it becomes, I mean, I, I've run major events at our church. Like we did trunk or treat at our church. That was something I was in charge of. Right, so that was a community-wide outreach. And so there were, you know, we'd have sometimes six, 700 people come through the church, sometimes more. I mean, depend, you count it by hot dogs, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, so we'd have volunteers or that I was in charge of. We'd have all sorts of equipment that needed to be rented. We'd have all these events, and I was in charge of that. And so, and there was maybe one or two years that we ran out of hot dogs a little early because it was on a Saturday rather than a Friday and a lot more people come on Saturday than Friday and I learned from that, you know. Um, uh, so, you know, there's, I'm not afraid of events. I'm not afraid of, uh, of those things. Those are, I mean, especially, I was doing all that in one day a week. You know, I worked Wednesday and then I worked at church on Sunday. I got five days, you know, and, and I can't even imagine what we can accomplish in five days. <laughs> and so I'm like, yes, bring it. Like I, anyways. It so, lots of extra time. <laughs> so in brief, <laughs> you feel you're a self-starter. Yes. And a self-motivator to stay with the task till it's done. Yes. Yes, I, I am definitely I think that's where we're, that's, that's what I want to I think that's where we're going. That's what I want to be sure <laughs> any, any other questions that y'all got? I know we're running short of time because y'all been here two hours and he's been talking for two hours. 